Imagine you're home alone with your one-month-old child. You hear a knock at the door, but before you can answer, a swarm of military police burst through the door. One of them puts a gun to your head and demands to see your spouse as the others ransack your home. They force you outside onto the street, and you see that they brought a military truck. You start to connect the dots as you see them shuffling your valuables from your home to their vehicle. Before you know it, they douse your house in gasoline and set it on fire. As you watch your house burn down in front of you, they pull away, leaving you with nothing but the clothes on your back and a crying baby in your arms. After a short while, you're reunited with your spouse, and you both agree that the only solution for the safety of your family is to leave the country. So you hire a transporter to take you to the border. You and a dozen other families are crammed into a tiny bus under the cover of night, and a trip that would normally take around 30 minutes ends up taking several hours, walking and driving to the Jordanian border. You finally arrive and cross along with hundreds of people, only to wait for several hours before you reach a tented holding area. There, you're searched, and depending on the mood of the officer in charge, anything that you brought with you can be confiscated or destroyed before your eyes. There's not enough room for everyone in the tents, so the women and children sleep inside as the men take turns sleeping outside. After several hours or even days, you're bused to the nearby town of Mafraq along the Jordanian-Syrian border. There, you're registered, questioned, and your identification papers are taken away from you. They've taken the only proof of your identity that you have and your ticket back home or anywhere else. You're corralled onto another bus and driven down a desert highway. On the horizon, you start to see a city of tents sprawling over the harsh landscape. After a moment, you begin to realize that this is your new home. This is the story of how Samir, a barber, and his family made their way to the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. And although there are many stories that are much, much worse than his, very few are more positive. I'm Faisal Trash. I was born in Syria, but moved to the United States when I was three years old, along with my parents and younger brother. Although I grew up in the United States and had an American childhood, my parents worked really hard to instill a deep sense of Syrian identity in my brother and me. Whenever anyone asked where I was from, I'd always reply without hesitation, Syria. Fast forward several years. I graduated from university and moved to Syria for a year to study Arabic. I enrolled in Damascus University's Higher Language Institute, a program specifically designed to teach foreigners Arabic. I was expecting this time in Syria to solidify my identity as Syrian. I was going to perfect my Arabic, I was going to meet Syrian friends, and I was going to become a local. I was finally going to feel like I was home. Well, I didn't. To my surprise, every time my classmates asked where I was from, I'd reply that I was American, but born in Syria. I couldn't say I was Syrian, because Syrian here meant the people you see around you on the bus on the way to class. Syrian here meant the baker who made chocolate-filled croissants in the morning. Syrian here meant the guy who sold bootleg DVDs around the corner from where I lived. I was definitely not the same as one of them. I began to realize that I was Syrian-American, not one or the other, but a mixture of both. And after the initial shock, it dawned on me that this was an advantageous position to be in. I could connect to two cultures, immersing myself in either one, but just as easily take a step back and view it as an outsider. I left Syria at the end of April 2011. The uprising had begun, 
and you can feel the tension on the ground in Damascus. I couldn't help but wonder what Syria was going to be like when I returned, or when that would even be. As the conflict dragged on and got more and more destructive, I watched from afar. I watched as peaceful protests were met with deadly force. I watched the people to pick up arms to defend themselves. Cities I'd so recently visited were bombed and shelled by the Syrian military forces. And all the while, the international community watched on as well. As the number of victims and displaced persons multiplied. As tough as this was for me, it was a million times more difficult for my parents, the real Syrians. They felt so helpless in alleviating the suffering of their people. And this guilt ate away at them, just like it did to the millions of other Syrian expats around the world. I began to wonder, what can I do? As a filmmaker, my job is to tell stories. I wanted to tell the story of the Syrian refugees because I felt like I, it was accessible to me and because I felt like I wasn't getting enough attention. So we decided to go to the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan because it's the world's largest Syrian refugee camp and because it's sort of become this unofficial spokesperson for the Syrian refugee crisis. So we focused our story on the barbers in the camp to inform our idea of what it meant to be a refugee through their eyes. When we arrived in the camp, we were very aware of the physical space that we were entering. The borders of the camp are very clearly delineated and there's a heavy security presence surrounding it. When we passed through the first checkpoint off the main highway, it felt like we were entering a different world. A long stretch of road led down to the actual main entrance of the camp, and there were barely any cars around as most people traveled on foot. Little kids pushed wheelbarrows back and forth from gate to gate, moving goods for a small fee, like taxis. Once we passed through the main entrance of the camp, it felt kind of surreal. The structures were temporary, but it seemed as though they'd been there for a long time, as they sat above this landscape of white gravel and rocks. We walked down the, uh, one of the side streets to check in with security, and within the first minute of us being in the camp, we felt something whiz by our backs. And then I felt something hit my bag. We turned around and looked behind us, and we saw a couple kids throwing rocks at us. We didn't know how to react to this, so we kept walking. Unsure of whether or not we should acknowledge this and scold them, or just keep walking and not draw any more attention to ourselves. Our guide turned around and yelled at them from afar, but they kept throwing rocks until we were too far down the street for them to reach us. This was our welcome into the Zatari refugee camp. There's a psychological barrier in addition to the physical one we just crossed. It felt as though we were entering their space. We were a crew of four people. Jan and Ty, our sound men and cameramen, both had blonde hair and blue eyes and were more than six feet two inches tall. Heidi, our producer, was a pretty American woman who didn't cover her hair with a headscarf. And of course, there was me. We were a group of USC graduate film students. This was definitely not our territory, but theirs. And who could blame them? To us, they were a spectacle. We were there to view them as if they were in some type of zoo. They were used to seeing foreigners come and go with their cameras, snapping photos of all the unreal sights and experiences, things that the refugees had to deal with on a daily basis. These strangers would then take these photos and leave the camp and show them to the world, never returning with any kind of aid or benefit to the camp. So this relationship was one-sided, and they began to distrust cameras in the camp. They felt exploited, a loss of dignity, 
not to mention fear that these images can somehow end up in the hands of the Syrian regime, endangering their families. To them, we are just like any other group of foreigners. It was critical for us to break this barrier and gain their trust, especially for me as a fellow Syrian. It was just as important for them to get to know us. So by learning about one another, we were able to cross this invisible barrier and we were no longer a strange sight to see for them. We were no longer abstract ideas in one another's minds. By, we formed personal connections and by the end of it, they started to expect us day after day. The most rewarding thing for us was getting to meet Samra's family. We met his wife, his baby son Hamza, his sisters and his nephews. And we learned their names and they learned ours. We ate with them and they showed us their home and their neighborhood. We accompanied Sama to Friday prayer and we got to go with them to Syria Tel Hill to make a phone call to the relatives back home. So there's this high point in the camp where if you switch out your Jordanian SIM card with your Syrian one, and you hold your phone up high, you can pick up reception coming out of Syria. So the refugees go up to this point in the evenings and they wave their phones around, and if they're lucky enough to catch the signal, they can call their friends and relatives back home in Syria. And this is the main form of communication that they have with their relatives back home. Hence the name Syria Tel Hill. Samir described many aspects of living in the camp to us, including how they received their food aid. في مركز اليو اف بي ما والله ما بعرف شو اسمه المونه شو اسمه هو دبليو اف يمكن هو نفس المونه هاي اللي نستلم منها الدور ببلش من الساعه 4 الصبح الدور بدك تقول اكثر من 1000 1500 شخص بيكون موجود على الدور just like any other form of mass aid distribution it's a very impersonal process and one that doesn't connect with the refugees so much so that sometimes as you can see they can't even remember the different acronyms of the organizations distributing the aid to them. As he mentioned, they wait in line by the hundreds or even thousands, and each family is represented by a UNHCR ration card with a barcode on it. And these cards don't have any information about the individuals on it or any kind of picture identification. And to them, it's, it's this dehumanizing process and they start to see it as an injustice. This aid is never sufficient to feed their families, and it's barely enough to maintain the status quo and help them survive. So although it's an essential service, their relationship to it is a negative one. There's a stark difference between how they describe this impersonal aid and aid and programs that are much more personal. For example, Samir's wife works at the UN Women and Girls Center, where they teach them various skills and crafts. And when she described this program to us, she told us about the Italian woman who came in on Tuesdays to teach them how to crochet. And then she told us about the German woman who came in on Wednesdays to teach them how to uh, make mosaics. It's very clear that they had a high amount of respect for these programs. And when she showed us her and her sister-in-law's handiwork, she was very proud and, and empowered. It's programs like this and others, such as the Taekwondo classes for children taught by South Korean teachers, that stick in these people's minds. They form personal connections that empower them, and they learn sustainable skills that help improve their quality of life, again, breaking down barriers. To them, they perceive this aid, this personal aid, as something positive in their lives, and something that gives them a purpose in the camp. It makes you wonder how much of a difference it would make if there were many more personal aid programs like this in the camp. Or even what would happen if the impersonal aid was handled and distributed in a much more personal way. If you ask any of the refugees in the camp what their biggest hope is, they'll all respond to go back home to Syria. Despite this longing, the refugees are resilient and they'll do anything they can to improve their current situations and their lives in the camp. 
They live moment to moment, knowing that their lives can just as easily and quickly change as they did as when they suddenly found themselves in the camp. بس يعني مغلب ومغلب هون كله عم بيزبط بس مش دائل حتى يعيش يومه يعني بسعادة مثلاً أو يروع عن باله شوي أحسن ما يضل مثلاً على البحث أو على التراب يقول لك لا بس عم بصب أو بزبط محل بعيش منه أحسن ما أمد إيدي لفلان ولفلان مثلاً أنا بكرة راجع على سوريا وتارك كل شيء وراي بدي يضل كله مو إنه شلون والمخيم تقريبا كلياته هيك ما بدي أقول يعني نسبة تسعين بالمية كله هيك. The Syrian refugees are industrious and resourceful and entrepreneurial. The barbers we met were lucky enough to be able to use their skill in the camp, but there are many other educated, skilled, and experienced individuals that remain unutilized. I believe that by helping them find a purpose in the camp through some type of personal interaction, it's, it's essential to is essential to improving their living conditions as well as their mental health. It's important to remember that all of these refugees are here because they have no choice. They experience traumatic events that are going to haunt them for the rest of their lives. So this impersonal aid is their sustenance, and it's necessary for their survival. But by providing personal aid, we can help ensure that they remain capable in rebuilding Syria's future. When I was in the camp, I felt Syrian. Not Syrian-American, just Syrian. To them, my American qualities didn't matter. I was Syrian in their eyes. I too miss Syria and miss my memories there. Syria was just five minutes away and within sight, taunting me. I just wanted to drop everything and feel its soil beneath my feet. But I couldn't. And they couldn't. But at least I had the advantage of being able to leave the camp and return to the United States and continue grad school, becoming engulfed once again in the busy distractions that made up my life. They were trapped there, with Syria a stone's throw away, taunting them. I began to understand how unbearable this must be for them. Our last day in the camp was bittersweet. As the sun set, we packed up our equipment in Samir's house, and we said our goodbyes and thanked them for their warmth and hospitality. And we each took turns taking photos with baby Hamza and gave him a big kiss on our way out. And as we headed out for the last time, we were excited about the positive experience we just had, but sad about leaving these new friends we'd made, hoping that the next time we see them would be in their homes in Syria. Thank you. <laughs>